in more depth. So what is pocket trash? So you can think about some things that we carry around in our backpacks today or purses or like all the little things that you might have in your pockets for day to day. So like chapstick, you know, coins, your key card, you know, perhaps a paper, maybe a pen if you like a tool. Um, in 18th century impressions, pocket trash can kind of help you flush out your character or your impression and give you like give you a better idea of kind of what your like role is in society and and give the public a better idea of kind of how to engage with you. And um, to do this, you also kind of need to have a general knowledge of like where the intersections of class, race, gender, etc., and how they are expressed in objects are, which we'll talk about a little bit more. And um, some of that knowledge just kind of comes from like reading primary sources, reading like articles and books and stuff. So you know, this is stuff that like you could theoretically do it without research, but it's gonna work a lot better for you if you do a little, at least a little bit of reading. Um, and this is going to bring us to material culture, which is something that is a growing like area under the study of history. Um, it involves how societies are grounded in objects, and we have to think about what these objects are, like what their meanings are, how they connect to society at large, how they interact with each other, and then in some levels, how they like push back against each other and sort of in society. Um, in studying archaeology and history, it shows behavior, identity, etc., on both a local scale, like a small scale, or a larger scale, like as a society. So if you think about how like you know one person might drink like tea or something, and then how that tea um, is influenced by like larger economies and like um, enslavement in different um, colonies in uh, below the equator and smaller economies within towns and stuff like that. Um, so these are what we might call small things forgotten or how people interact with everyday objects and where their interactions fit in a broader scale. Um, and this also includes big things, so it can include like physical documents like the Constitution or the Declaration of Independence, or it can include small things like bills of credit, notes, doodles, something's diary, a pipe stem, those are big in archaeology, um, clipping, things like that. Um, and again, academically, it occupies a space between and like kind of overlapping archaeology, history, and anthropology, which is like somewhere that is kind of under a little bit of academic debate, but like it's a really fun place to do research in because there's a lot of interesting things to look at. So choosing pocket trash. What kinds of things might someone of your impression use on a daily basis? What might they want to save and why? What kinds of things would you keep and why? Something, somewhere to start would be paper items, coinage, small things like that. You know, you can, sometimes you can pull directly from your life, you know, like say, let's see, my younger brother likes to doodle a whole lot, so he always carries around like a little piece of paper and a pen in his pocket, along with like a couple of coins and usually a dollar bill rolled up, which turns up as you might expect in the washer at the end of the day. <laughs> but um, so that's something that he, if he wanted to do an 18th century impression, which I don't think he does, but we're working on it. Um, <laughs> he might, you know, think about incorporating that and like carrying around, you know, a quill or some paper or a little pencil or something like that. Um, so there's general categories, there's <coughs> items you might carry in the 18th century, and then also items that provide backstory, but things you might not necessarily carry, like clippings or, you know, a, like, advertisement or something. So our first item of interest is newspaper clippings. These can be anywhere from, um, like, having relevant information to the event you're going to, so say there's, like, somebody wrote an article or an opinion on like a battle, battle or a like, if you're interpreting a specific event, like they, when they do the um, War Done War, like coming out onto the uh, port or the portico of like the governor's, governor's palace and say, talking about the, um, him wanting to, giving freedom to enslaved people who came and joined the uh, British army, then that would be like, a relevant company to carry, you know. Um, if you've got a copy of like reproduction, you might be able to carry around a whole paper. But you know, you want to be like careful of a couple of things, namely like literacy rates, because like a lot of people could, I think a fair amount of people could read, not as many people could write, 
um, but also like circulation rates. So you wouldn't really be carrying, it'd be less likely for you to have like a Boston newspaper in uh, you know, Virginia. I mean, it's certainly something that you could like, you know, decide that you want to carry, but um, you know, just be mindful of that. And then ideological or political writings, these can be in pamphlet form or they can be from a newspaper because you know like um, stuff like, I think there was some Benjamin Franklin stuff that got printed, like serialized in a newspaper. Um, there's like the letters from, um, I think it's Scotus Americanus or whatever in the newspaper um, that you could carry around as like kind of showing, you know, your political opinions or just kind of generic like political opinions. Um, also ads, and there's lots of types of ads, and we'll go into some of these, um, but ads for clothing, shops, runaway ads, things like that, that um, might like be part of your impression if you're doing a trade or a skill or something, or like that might um, just be some item of, in of interest that your character, or not character, but like interpretation um, might you know, want to have. Please let me know if I'm going too fast. <laughs> So we come to runaway ads, and I've got a lovely book over here called Servants, uh, Slaves, Servants, and, nope, it's Wives, Slaves, and Servant Girls. Name changed a couple of times. Um, so there is like some tension with carrying run runaway ads, at least as like in my opinion. Um, so there's, it, it's like not, probably not something that you would have carried in the 18th century, um, because, you know, it's kind of like a giveaway of who you are. but. Um, However, it is very useful to explaining or enriching your background, um, or in helping to justify like the reason that you might have a British regimental haversack on your person rather than like a continental one if you're following the continental army, um, because you're a thief. <laughs> also, they're useful for engaging with the public, like having them spot you. And on the strength did a really good demonstration with this. At, I think it was like a market fair or something where they had posted these runaway ads around like the encampment and then had like a little kind of, I guess it was like a social media challenge or something where they had like um, uh, attendees like take pictures of the runaways, runaways and then like bring them back for I think a prize or something. Um, so there is kind of a note of any that you want to kind of use these with caution and care to be treated with a certain amount of respect. <coughs> So continued, these are a couple of runway ads. So the top one is from Virginia Gazette under Hunter in January 30th, 1752. That is for a white servant woman named Sarah Benfield. She's about five feet, two inches high, about 30 years of age, and a, mark, and a dark complexion with bad teeth and black hair, which curls down her neck behind. And I can't read the rest of that. <laughs> but these are a couple of examples of things you might find on, um, like, if you go search a database or something. Um, they also have one for uh, from the subscriber living in the, near the capital in this city, an apprentice lad named William Griffin. He is about 19 years of age, about five feet seven inches high, well fat with a high forehead, freckled face, hollow gray eyes, a wild look when sharp looks spoken to. So there's like a variety of things that might be included in a runway ad, anything from like your basic appearance to what you might be carrying to um, you know what somebody might assume your personality is or your trade. And this is the on the strength um, demonstration when they were talking about using um, runway ads to kind of build an impression. Um, and this is just from their Instagram page. And then they had like the runway ad. Um, in part of the post. But they have pulled that from, and I can pull it up later if you guys want to read for you. So our next item is a little bit trickier. We have letters and journals. So during this time, letters are widely sent and used as a form of communication. And um, most people can read. Writing is like a whole different thing. But, um, and that also depends on your class, your location, what type of schooling you might work, you might have, your gender, things like that. Um, they are received, read, and written in camp, on campaign, and at home. Um, at this time, the postal system was pretty like robust. It was getting there. Um, and typically, we use linen paper and quills, which are usually turkey or goose feather, um, and ink, which can be walnut, iron gall, or using gum arabic, and things like that. We actually had a nice um, crop of, I think it was. 
walnuts falling from the trees up near Blair, if you did, guys notice that. Um, they're green on the outside, just they're, they're round, and they've got, like, if you boil them, you can get some nice ink out of it. But didn't try that this year, but maybe I should. Um, so when you're not, like, actively interpreting, it's, like, in my opinion, it's fine to use a standard calligraphy, calligraphy pen and nib because it takes a lot of practice to get um, the penmanship, like, anywhere near looking like what it did look like. And I've got a book up there also, um, The Universal Penman by George Bickham, I think, and he also publishes, like, the, I think it was the Secretary, uh, Secretary's Guide to Penmanship or something. Um, but there's, like, multiple penmanship manuals and letter manuals that you can look at, and, like, most of them are free online. You can find them and sort of get a better feel for how, like, people in the 18th century wrote um, both physically and, like, the style and sort of turn of phrases that they would have used. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Journals are also portable, and they are a great way to practice 18th century style and composition. And it's also something that if you don't open it, nobody can see what's inside it. So you can write it in normal handwriting and like just use it as a way to kind of, you know, work at it and practice. Um, and extants that I've looked at, which is not many, unfortunately, um, tend to be more heavily male, white, and upper class, and are typically less common amongst black populations because of literacy laws and stuff like that. Uh, that is not to say that they did not exist. They may have existed and we don't have them or they could be buried in an archive somewhere. So, like, there's not, you're not, like, completely limited here. Um, just, it takes some research to kind of find, like, um, not really justification, but, like, extensive of base things off of. Also got documents of indenture. They can be related to a trade. Um, these can be used by both men and women, white and black, to denote apprenticeships, servitude, and sometimes enslavement things like that. Um, sometimes they can be used to like look at uh, you know, owing somebody money or owing somebody land, things like that. Um, they can provide a background for your impression or justification. You know, like, here, this is my indenture. This means I'm a servant. Um, you know, you might be a runaway, you might be a refugee, traveling with the army. We have records of both men and women who were tradesmen, tradesmen and tradesmen and women traveling with um, sometimes more with the British Army, but some with the Continental Army as well, um, who might feasibly carry around a record of indenture. And there's some runaway ads of people running away from their apprenticeships to join the Army. So that's that too. And then we've got military documents, which I don't know much about. So that's a, if you know if you want to know more, ask Matt, because I'm sure he's looked at more than I have. Um, they include like general orders, runaway ads again for deserters and stuff like that, um, orders for officers and, and NCOs, and then occasionally like maps or plans depending on your rank. Um, these are a couple that I pulled off of a database through Ancestry, I think, that was also through like the Library of Congress. Um, and I still can't really read them, especially because the resolution on these is not great. But one is like a bill, I think, for pension, and then the other is just like a list of. Um, I think a part of the record of like names and stuff are probably also mentioned, but yeah, and that's the source at the bottom. What's that? Oh, for officers, inventories, like pouring lists oh, and I like accounting that. stuff. That I didn't mention it in my lecture last week, but I just remembered that when I saw the list and stuff, lists, just list of things, list of names, and all of that stuff. Well, there's also for like in general, if you're a refugee and stuff, you might have an inventory, you know, from your house. Um, inventories <coughs> are a super common thing to have if you're like interpreting somebody who lives in a specific house because it gives you a record of all the items in the specific rooms that they were in. But like Matt said, they might, they're probably also carried by people just to kind of have an idea of like what kind of stuff they had with them at any given amount, I mean, any given time. And they've got coinage and money. So off of the paper items, we've got paper money, which you can get reproductions of, and then you could also like print your own off of a computer with some nice paper. Um, I'm pretty sure there's multiple places you can find stuff within the public domain. Um, so this is a half dollar from Philadelphia. And during this time, like um, through the revolution, we didn't have federalized monies or systems of money. So like it was based, it was state by state. So you're gonna have a different bill for every like single state that you're in. 
um, and different coins for different states in some cases. And then there's also like a mixture of British coins, Spanish coins, French coins, Amer some American coins being printed at this point. Um, so you're gonna have like, you know, it's very possible that you'd have a mix of coins from different sources. Um, and then there's also stuff like pieces of eight that are pretty, that are really common that like aren't British, um, that um, you know most people would have. Uh, coinage can also theoretically give a clue to your loyalties or your profession, depending on uh, whether or not you have British or American coins or stuff like that. Now we come to personal items and toiletries. So this picture is from the Mount Vernon collections. And it is of a razor case, I believe, that was theorized to be George Washington's, uh, possibly. Um, so for personal items and toiletries, there's a pretty wide variety of stuff you can include. You've got like a handkerchief, which could be embroidered or plain, and you can either do one sock or a um, uh, fichu, which is the wrong term, but I'm going to use that anyways. Um, or like a handkerchief that you, you know, blow your nose in. So either of those is perfectly acceptable. Um, you've got a corn comb, which I've got one of one of over there. Um, you've got compact razor case, which is like I'm assuming this. Um, maybe a tin of powder and pomade, um, because both men and women would be, would have used powder and pomade. A fan, like the one I've got over there, or a bone bone toothbrush is something that I've added kind of specifically for like impressions and reenacting. Um, if you're doing stuff like overnight and you don't want to have a modern toothbrush on you. I have not yet found a like 18th century extant of a bone or wooden toothbrush. There's probably one out there. I'm not 100% sure, but like people did brush their teeth, um, and it like you can find um, vintage ones and antique ones from like the early um, 20th century that like are still fine and like new that you can use that would look quote unquote more period accurate. Um, if you were like reenacting and didn't want to bring like you know a plastic like I don't know brand toothbrush, um, I've also got glasses. So glasses are kind of tricky. Um, they're typically used by upper class men. Women didn't often wear them, although I have seen some paintings with older women wearing them. So I'm sure it's not like a cut and dry thing. Um, uh, lenses are very small circles usually with um, relatively light prescription uh, because like the you know, ex prescriptions that you get nowadays are much stronger than whatever they had the technology for back then. As far as I know, again, anybody wants to correct me, go ahead. But, um, and we're usually not hooked up with you later. And then, no, I don't think we're able to use bifocals because if I remember correctly, Benjamin Franklin invented those, but I'm not 100% sure if that's a, like, history of or not. Um, but yeah. Uh, no bifocals. I mean, it is a thing where, like, there's that debate within the reenacting community of, like, if you need your glasses, just wear your glasses, which is fine. I mean, like, if you want to use glasses as part of your impression, it's better, typically better to, and you don't, like, need them, need them to see. It's typically better to use ones that are accurate. Um, and then we've got leather wallets, which I didn't grab a picture of, but they usually are, like, medium-ish, and, like, they'll unfold, and Usually men have these, um, but again, like if you're a woman and you want somewhere to keep your phone and like your debit card, it's, it's fine, theoretically. Um, but you can get pretty good reproductions of those at, on like different stores on Etsy and so. And we've got entertainment, which is some more paper. <laughs> um, so first we've got pamphlets, which are easier to, easier to carry around than books. They're usually like folded, um, paper, or sometimes if, you, if you're talking about chapbooks, it's like one piece of paper that's been folded into eight. Um, they are more accessible to the public. They're very cheap. Um, we have records of like basically everybody from almost every class being able to purchase pamphlets and um, leaflets and things. Um, topics from politics to prose to um, like instructional manuals, usually less than 100 pages or so. Because if it's any larger than that, you start to have to like actually find things. Um, and then there's also chapbooks, which is like one of my favorite things ever, because they're like the 18th century equivalent of zines, because they're essentially like seven to eight page books that a lot of times would have used a very large piece of paper that you like fold in half multiple times, and then you get like this little book that you can stick. Like a lot of the times, they had um, little like kids' stories in them or um, 
just little like kind of like serialized things or a lot of times they also had music um, and those are extremely common but unfortunately we don't have a lot left um, and the ones that we do have as extants are typically in like a couple of specific uh, I think British libraries because um, they just were so common that they considered them trash um, so we don't have and that's my note down there is that like they kind of speak to the changing idea of what is valuable to keep and what we kind of consider trash. Um, but that's a whole like that's a whole thing. Um, so books can be either softbound or hardbound. Um, with usually with a marble cover and a leather spine, they can also be full leather. If you're getting a repro or if you're actually in the 18th century, that is going to be more expensive. So I'm making a educated guess that it probably would have been more common to have like a marble cover with uh, either a quarter bound or a half bound spine and then like quarters. Um, they can be anything from manuals to fiction to song collection, um, or song collection, um, and like political things, just anything that's longer. Like they had as much variety in their books as we do today. Um, and then we've also got games, and I've got a pack of cards over there. So we've got different types of dice, different types of cards, and um, just things you can like gamble with a lot. Um, there's also like the whole realm of kids, kids games, but I didn't really go into that because most of the people that we're interpreting, while we might actually have children in the 18th century, none of us actually have children right now. <laughs> I would hope not. So um, we, you know, I could go into that, but anyways. Um, so also ballads. Uh, which can be printed in chapbook collections, bound collections, or as broadsides. Um, and they are also extremely common during the time. Um, but um, again, because they were so common, people were like, oh, we're just gonna throw this away. So we don't have like that many extants. Um, and they can be hard to like date exactly, especially if you're looking at a couple of like digitized extants that we have, um, but like, you know, there's a lot of overlap in some of them um, because, like, you can see how, like, sometimes you can find a broadside from, like, this late 17th century that pops up again in, like, 73, and, like, just because it, like, doesn't have an extant broadside in between there doesn't mean that, like, one didn't exist, and, you know, there was probably multiple, like, renditions of something to change it. Um, So these are a couple of examples of broadsides. This is a one from the mid 18th century, I believe, printed in London, um, that was on a larger piece of paper. And they would have printed on both the front sides of the paper. Um, and um, this one is like part of the chapbook from, I think, either the early 18th century or the late 18th century. I don't remember. But so the price is one half penny, so they're like kind of pretty cheap. I don't remember exactly where that falls on the scale of coinage, but I think that's smaller than a lot of stuff. Um, so when we're talking about making things, you can do things by hand because that's always an option. Um, copying documents, letters, etc., by hand is like something that is very useful to learn um, in general and also for interpretation. And then like drawing elements of documents or sketches by hand. So like if you were to print the uh, design like the uh, typed version or typed portion of like an indenture on a computer and then adding in like the parts that would have been written by hand, that also works. Um, so on the computer, this is also a lot of really good skills to learn and it's also can be really fun, um, is designing using programs to re recreate documents. Um, and there's a lot of like stuff like free fonts and whatever out there that like people designed to look like 18th century fonts. Some of them are pulled directly from books. Like there's a couple that are variations on Castlin, which is a very popular typeface of the time, um, developed by William Castlin um, in like 1730, 1740-ish. Um, but you know, stuff in like Microsoft Word, the Apple, sweet Apple equivalent, which is like pages and stuff. Um, you know, you can use Photoshop and InDesign, but you can also use free alternatives like Canva, online, you know, even Google Docs, GIMP, which is a free like alternative to Photoshop, um, and then again, like 18th century type typeface fonts because those still exist. 
and we've taken those into the 21st century with us. Do, what are the actual like, names of the fonts? Um, so I am Fell is one of them that's on Google Docs like for free. That okay. I'm, I can't remember. That might be a <coughs> version of Castlon, and I think it might also be one that was like from an earlier book or something. And then there's like Castlon itself, um, okay. which sometimes pops up as the 1830s version, but you can find like the 18th century version um, if you do a Google. Um, and then there's, I can send you like a list, and I can put one on the group drive because um, I've got some somewhere. Deep my computer. So, and that was the main portion of the talk. Now you get to see like the six pages of bibliography that I did because I didn't want to leave you all with like nothing. Um, so for material culture, um, I'm just going to throw up, um, throw Holland's element up there, Archaeology of the Modern World. Um, so this is like talking about um, issues of scale and identity um, with small things, which is like, you know, would, would include pocket trash or things like pottery coins pipe stems, food ways, things like that. Um, they're just generally talking about like kind of explanations of this stuff. Um, and then also James Keats's In Small Things Forgotten, which like is a really good book when you, if you want to learn a lot about pottery and pipe stems, um, again. And like he talks a lot about how um, um, like these small things can, like exactly what small things can tell us about like people's identity and like cultures at large. Um, however, he, he does like focus sometimes too much on like binary explanations of stuff, which like is kind of a general danger in archaeology, but you know, that happens. Um, again, these are from my intro class reading lists and it's not comprehensive and there's a lot more and there's a lot of debate about these. So like, don't take my word for it. You can read it and critique it in your own time. Um, so this is for newspapers. We've got a bunch of databases available for this one. Um, the 17th and 18th century burning collection newspapers are particularly nice. It's a really nice, like, <coughs> large collection. Um, I'm pretty sure that one's got both, like, American and British papers in it. Um, and most of our stuff is, like, oops, most of our stuff is sort of biased towards um, American and European. Um, there's, like, at least in this one database, is slightly less available for non quote unquote Western countries and colonies, but like again, it's SWAM. I'm sure you can find stuff um, if you wanted to research that sort of thing. Um, we've got the Colonial Williamsburg Digital Library, which has all of the Virginia Gazettes digitized. Some of them are kind of hard to read. Um, and they also offer reprints in the Prentice Shop, I believe, which is not a paid advertisement. I just really like the Prentice Shop, and their reprints are really good because they do them on the printer there. So, like, it's historically accurate. Um, and then there's also the early American newspaper series, which has more newspapers from, like, the up and down the East Coast. But yeah, so this is one of the Virginia Gazettes up here. And that, I think, is, like, the front page to one of them. So, for runaway ads, we've got on the Army Strength Instagram because that's the example I used. Um, and their interpretation group mostly focus on female civilians and camp followers, but they have a lot of tips in general for like um, interpretation, getting started, and then in general, like inspiration and research stuff. Um, there's Don Hake's um, Wives, Slaves, and Servant Girls, which is the um, one runaway ad, collection of runaway ads for women. Um, and it's also pretty easy to find those through like databases and swim, uh, the newspaper databases, if you just do like a, uh, usually they're either noted by type or if you do like a word search, not word search, but you know what I mean. Um, keyword search, there we go. Again, the newspaper collection of Colonial Williamsburg. And then um, the Geography of Slavery database, which can which is a very detailed um, index of runway ads for both enslaved persons and indentured servants, mostly in Virginia. Um, and has them uh, grouped by like year and then name and um, like newspaper or you know geographic place is very helpful. Um, for letters and journals, um, I just like didn't go super deep into this because I tried to put a lot in here and like there there are a lot of really good resources. I just didn't have time to find them and it's very frustrating. But um, we have the we have access to the Adams and Jefferson letters, which are wonderful. Um, through the SWAM databases, and it's a super large collection. I think there's like at least a couple hundred in there. Um, so Abigail and John's letters in particular kind of give you an idea of like um, courting relationships, and then um, Mary's life, it's there like that. 
and then both write to acquaintances as well as like personal uh, political figures and Abigail is as well, which is something that like we don't find a whole ton of, which is really unique. Um, there's also the diary of Sarah Hurst, which I tried to find in the Barnes and Noble and did not get to find. Um, but it's an English woman's diary from 1759 to 1762. Um, so it's like kind of right before the Revolutionary War, but it's a good like place to start if you're, you know, like portraying a woman who's coming over as a camp follower with the British Army or something like that. Because it gives you a good idea of like women in a particular set of status as like um, personal lives during that period. Um, there's the Princeton collections, which I linked on here, um, which is a lot of women's diaries, both American and English, and they're also mixed access and usage. So like you can get into some of them for free, and I think some of them you have to like be part of Princeton to do, which is frustrating. Um, there's somebody who did this awesome list of men's diaries for the Continental Army. I don't know who Bob, Bob McDonald is, but like they're amazing because I didn't have to do any of this work. Um, so that's a link to like all of these. And I think he has like um, from, from men of different ranks in there too. Um, and then there's also the Universal Pendant by George Bickham, which you can get, I think in CW, you can get it on Amazon. Sometimes you can find it online. You have to like look at the right places. But um, for documents of indenture, I just linked um, the one that I found you can find those through Google. You can also find them through SWAM. Military documents was also just citing the one I found, again, through SWAM. Um, we've got the War Department collection, which is like through the, some, I guess the War Department. Um, I don't remember. But, um, and for personal items of Twin Fuse, these are also all from, um, this is on, it's really interesting, it's older, but it's on the um, history of hornsmiths in Massachusetts, which covers both horn combs, which is what I was really looking for, and then also just like other things that they made before. So like there's a bunch of kind of interesting things in there. Um, and then there's the Mount Vernon thing on George Washington's razor case. And then George, George Washington's. And then the, this article on 18th century spectacles from an optometrist college, which I did not know existed. Um, then there's Quidditch. And this one is um, on different types of coins and like where and how they were produced. And you can find a bunch of articles that in general, if you Google, that show you that. Um, just reiterating databases, there's Echo, which is like my favorite one. Um, it's the 18th century collections online, and most of the stuff they have is from England. They have a couple of things from America on there, but um, it's like tons and tons and tons of scanned documents and like books, pamphlets, songbooks, novels, political writings, like everything. Like there's some stuff that is like several hundred pages long. <laughs> and then there's also things like chat books. They ha do have a couple of scanned ones on there that are, you know, like eight pages. Um, so they have a lot of, like, they've done a lot of great work um, digitizing extants so that we can look at them when we're not immediately at, like, the institution that houses the extants. Um, and then again, the same newspaper collections. Um, America Broadsides and Ephemera has some. They tend to be more 19th century, but they do have a couple of 18th century broadsides in there. Um, and then also just in general, the Colonial America database through, I think it's like an off-branch BBC or something, I'm not entirely sure, but that one's also awesome this one. Um, ballads, if that's a thing you're interested in. They are in the USCB Broadside the Ballad Archive, brought to us by University of California Santa Barbara, um, has a lot of them. Broadside ball Ballads Online from the Bodleian um, has a lot of them. Um, Echo through Swim has some, and then the British, there's also like the British Library did a really good article on chat books, where they included a couple of links to extants, um, and just included general information about chat books, like uh, some numbers and stuff. Um, and then there's books and pamphlets for reproductions. Um, one of my personal favorites is from Common Hands, because they do some really nice um, binding work. Um, and then there's also Timberl Popper and Kuna on Etsy, Drano books or something out of Louisville. Um, but I'm not 100% sure. He's really cool. Okay, well then he, he does also does reproduction books um, and stuff like that. <coughs> and there's there's others like at any like event that has settlers, there will usually be well sometimes be at least one person who's selling like and stuff. And that's the end. I will post it on the group drive so that y'all can look over stuff again or get like links. Mm -hmm. yes. I yeah.
do want to point out two additional resources that I may have missed since I had to leave for a few seconds. Uh, but one is uh, the through the University of Virginia, the Geography of Slavery database. Oh, you did? Okay, I didn't see it, so I just wanted to double check. Uh, and then also pocketbooks. We do have a few examples of flame-stitched fabric pocketbooks for women. So if you want a pretty flame-stitched pocketbook, feel free to go for that instead of a leather wallet too, because they are fun to make. I need to make one, but yes. It was very good, very handy. Thank yes. you. And all those links are wonderful. I can't wait to explore them. <laughs> I, I, I felt, feel really bad because I kind of overloaded y'all with like links and stuff. But oh no, that's no, great. And there was, wonderful. Not, there, was like, there was so much that like I, I probably could have spent like two months on this, like two, two or more months and not like put everything in there that I wanted to. But yeah, yeah, because there's like, there's just tons of, tons of stuff out there. Especially with the internet. The internet is a wonderful place for resources. <laughs>